Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Hebrews, entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Now, I wonder, the message of Hebrews, the last days, what could that mean? This is lesson number 12 in that series for March 19 of 2022, entitled, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. That sounds like a good idea. Well, as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have bowed here in your presence, asking for your guidance as we study together these final passages in the book of Hebrews. There are some great lessons in this series, as we have seen already, and now help us to gather what is here taught about the unshakable kingdom. May we be a part of it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're coming near the end of this series of lessons on Hebrews. Jim? Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 29. The passage for this week is the climax of the letter, and it sums up its main concern by repeating the idea that which is it started. God has spoken to us in the person of his son, and we need to pay careful attention. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, verse 25, to him. So it's the beginning of the book and end of the book. It's both, it's talking about God's message to us through the son, okay? The description of Jesus in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, epitomizes the letter's assertions about him. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and his blood provides salvation for believers. His priestly and royal ministry in our behalf is a cause for celebration for the heavenly hosts. And finally, Hebrews 12 verses 25 to 29 contain the last and climactic exhortation. God's judgment is coming. It will bring destruction to his enemies, but vindication and the, a kingdom to his people. Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29 from the Bible Study Guide. Okay. The onlooking universe saw the truth about God and his government after the life and death of Jesus so clearly demonstrated those facts. They will never again listen to Satan's arguments, accusations. They began celebrating when Jesus cried, it is finished, as he died on the cross. They knew, I mean, the disciples here on this earth were in deep mourning, but hell, heaven is celebrating. Amazing. Uh, they knew right at that point that the fate of Satan and his evil associate angels was fixed. And, and unfortunately, the angels in heaven probably had a lot of friends who their their fate was sealed right at that point in time so it wasn't all celebration i think they were probably sorry too for, for some of their friends that evil group all will finally be destroyed at the third coming after everyone who has ever existed in the universe has had a chance to see the truth about god's government and the truth about satan's government okay carrie you want to tell us about hebrews 12 read that for us yes i'll be reading eight, uh, verses 18 through 29 you have not come as the people of israel came to what you can feel to mount sinai with its blazing fire the darkness and the gloom the storm the blast of a trumpet and the sound of a voice when the people heard the voice, they begged not to hear another word because they could not bear the order which said, if even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling and afraid. Now let me interrupt for a second. Um, it's interesting if you look at that very carefully and you compare it with passages back in Exodus, Moses wasn't afraid for himself. He was afraid when he recognized the condition that the people were in. So this trembling and afraid wasn't for himself. That was for, he was worried about the people. Go ahead. 
Instead, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, with its thousands of angels. You have come to the joyful gathering of God's firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, who is the judge of all people, and to the spirits of good people made perfect. You have come to Jesus, who arranged the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that promises much better things than does the blood of Abel. Be careful, then, and do not refuse to hear him who speaks. Those who refused to hear the one who gave the divine message on earth did not escape. How much less shall we escape, then, if we turn away from the one who speaks from heaven? His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, I will once more shake not only the earth, but heaven as well. The words once more plainly show that the created things will be shaken and removed so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Let us be thankful then because we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him with reverence and awe. Because our God is indeed a destroying fire. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Our God is a destroying fire? Is indeed Does that sound like a friendly situation? No, not really. It's American Bible Society, 1992, the Good News Translation. That's got all kinds of it, doesn't it? Okay, so with that kind of scary news, we need to read several more passages. Duane, you want to jump in there and, and what Ellen White says about, give us, give us some information about all that? To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. There's the verse. Hebrews 12, 29. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. Desire of Ages, page 107. Okay, so let's think about that for a second. What... Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. No problem at all. Didn't bother them. They were happy to see him. Later, God said, after we'd fallen into sin many generations, God said to Moses, you, you, can't, you can't see me. It would destroy you. So what happened to us between Adam and Moses that changed us from being life-sustaining by God to being life-destroying? by God's presence. And that's one of the questions that the Bible doesn't really answer. So let's see whatever else what says here. Go ahead. Charles. The glory of his countenance, which to the righteous is life, will be the wicked, will be to the wicked a consuming fire. Just like we read earlier, yeah. consuming fire. Because of love rejected, grace despised, the sinner will be destroyed. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, six, page 600, paragraph 2. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By love of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 764, paragraph 1. Okay, so if we pace ourselves out of harmony with God, what happens when his glory shows up? It's a consuming fire. Why is it that the same glory, the glory of God's presence, gives life to the righteous but destroys the wicked? What does sin do to us that causes that change when the glory of God appears to us? Well, now let's talk a little bit about what this fire is. Exodus 24, 16 and 17. The dazzling light of the Lord's presence came down on the mountain. We're talking about Sinai now. 
to the Israelites, the light looked like a fire burning on top of the mountain. What, what, it actually was what? It was God's presence, right? Mm -hmm. But it looked like what? A fire. The cloud covered the mountain for six days, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. And I, I like to think of myself, put myself back in these situations. The, the, the mountain, none of those mountains in that area of the world are very tall. So the children of Israel, I'm sure, could watch Moses marching right up there and disappearing into the fire. Hmm. What would you think as you watched Moses? There's our leader, the one who always tells us what to, where to go and what to do and sort of... Whoosh. Where'd he go? Yeah, really come back. Okay. Well, Paul, in describing here in Hebrews, the imagery that he, he picks up is from Daniel 7 to draw a conclusion to the book of Hebrews. Charles, I think I'm that's done. yours. You're done? Yeah. Okay, Daniel 7, 9 to 14. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There are many thousands of people there to serve him. Now, these would be beings. These are, these are not human beings. They're angels. And millions of these people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. While I was looking, I could still hear the little horn bragging and boasting as I watched the fourth beast, as I watched the fourth beast was killed and its body was thrown into the flames and destroyed. The other beasts had their power taken away, but they were permitted to go on living for a limited time. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was appointed, he was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. So who is the human being that approaches God's throne? Yes. Must be Christ. Christ. Yeah. yeah, Jesus Christ, of course. He's taken on humanity. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. And then dropping down to verse 18, and the people of the supreme God will receive royal power and keep it forever and ever. Good news, Bible. In Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, we read about a joyful gathering of God's firstborn whose names are written in heaven. That's, in, from, that's a translation from the Good News Bible. So what kind of records are kept in heaven? All you experts at computers? <laughs> Is somebody up there with a quill pen writing our sins and our thoughts and everything at high speed? Or does God have a very... I mean, think of everything that's recorded in our brains using DNA and all those other processes that we are just beginning to understand. I'm sure God has an incredibly effective system in heaven that keeps everything recorded. What would he do with that information? Well, it's going to be brought up in the judgment. Well, who's going to who's going to bring it up? Well, the devil's going to bring it up. Well, but the devil's already uh, made himself of no, nobody has chosen here of his side. Well, <laughs> a lot of people have. Yeah, but we don't need to re rehash them. Well, but we're only rehashing them if we don't know what's on those records. The records are there. Um, well, well, Most I, of it's pretty obvious. I don't think you need to g um, get I into the minutiae. We, we, we are human beings, you know. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. He wants to make sure that we are convinced mm -hmm. uh, that this one was okay to be saved and this one chose not to be saved. So look into it. It's not for his own sake that this is being yeah. done. And more than that, because they, the records need to be reviewed for the benefit of the onlooking universe. Yes, yes. But more than that, there's a simple answer to that. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He, not, he, has, he doesn't forget anything. The records are all there. He won't need to write anything down then, would he? 
Well, that's, that's, that's why I asked you what, what kind of records there were. <laughs> I think we do a lot of sanctified speculation. Yeah. yeah there you are, right, right. <laughs> well, some places, if you want to look it up, you people who are listening in, Exodus 32, 32, Psalm 56, verse 8, Daniel 12, verse 1, Malachi 3, verse 16, Luke 10, verse 20, Revelation 13, verse 8, and Revelation 17, 8 are just a few of the places in the Bible where it talks about records being written down in heaven. While it is quite certain that there are no actual books in heaven, like we think about a book, with things written down as would have been done a hundred years ago, God has a complete and perfect record of everything that we've ever done or thought. To some people, this idea is frightening. The ultimate victory of Christ will come at the third coming when he is raised up high above the New Jerusalem, which has then come down to this earth, remember. Everyone who has ever lived will see him crowned with glory forever and ever. The wicked outside the New Jerusalem and the righteous inside. At that time, the wicked will have been raised and will raised from dead and will suddenly have revealed to their minds everything that they have ever done. They will understand exactly why they are outside the city and not inside. And if you want to read the, all about that in detail, exactly how it all happens, Great Controversy, written by Ellen White, pages 662 through 671. But the point is that everybody, uh, it, the universe already has, has begun its celebration. I'll, I'll hold on with the rest of the information as we're coming up in a moment later. As we said earlier, they began celebrating the moment Jesus cried, it is finished, and died. At that time, they knew that Satan's fate was sealed. And his name was vindicated. God's name was vindicated. There. That's right. God's name was vindicated. There was celebration. That's why all over the universe. Now, the controversy continues here mm -hmm. because of our, our part of choice. Yeah. Yes. So why shouldn't we be rejoicing with the angels? If we have a place with God and His kingdom, shouldn't we be rejoicing? Absolutely. We realize that Jesus has won the great controversy by answering all the devil's accusations and questions about the character and government of God. Jesus has now returned to heaven in His human form and joined the Father and the Holy Spirit in speaking on our behalf and turning the accusations of Satan back on Satan himself. This is what is happening right now in heaven. Okay. Hey, Carrie, you're next. Zechariah 3. Reading from chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. Let me interrupt for a second. Uh, some people don't realize this is not the Joshua that followed Moses back when they had come out of Egypt and were just entering into the Promised Land. This is a Joshua who was high priest. He was from the family of Levi, so he's qualified to be a high priest, uh, the family of Aaron even. And he was the high priest that came back from Babylon after the Babylonian captivity. So this is a long, this is a thousand years after the previous one we talked about. So this is a very handful of people. Is, Relative of a few is, thousand people. Like came is, back uh, from Nehemiah, Babylon. Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. these are the folk. That, Those people. Joshua went yeah. with him. Ezra and Nehemiah hadn't even shown up yet. They're going to come a little bit later. But same group of people it's talking about, yeah. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. And what do the filthy clothes represent? Sins. 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 Yeah. Okay. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. 
They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Prophets and kings and the great so, controversy. Yeah. If you want to read about that story, exactly how, hap how the judgment takes place, you can read in detail Prophets and Kings 582 to 592. This is one of the books that's written by Ellen White and Great Controversy, page 479 to 491. Very clear and very excellent description of this whole process. Okay. If Jesus has won the great controversy by his life, his death, and his resurrection, then why does Hebrews describe God as now standing in the position of a judge? Isn't it all, shouldn't it be all over with? Shouldn't it be done? Well, God will never bring the great, and here's the part I want to emphasize. <clears throat> God will never bring the great controversy to a conclusion until every person who has ever lived saints and sinners alike has had a chance to review his own life against the great yeah against the great record books of heaven and the bible then all even satan himself will admit that god has done everything he possibly could to save everyone and if we had half an hour to look at philippians 2 5 to 11 we would see that in all its detail okay daniel 7 9 to 10 and 22. Well, we already read 9 to 10. Just 22 we have there. Go ahead. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. Okay. <clears throat> From these verses, we can conclude that the judgment takes place in heaven with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all defending us, and of course that's uh, Romans 8, it says that all three of them are defending us, against the accusations of Satan. And the onlooking jury consists of more than a hundred million angels, including our own guardian angel. This judgment is good news because putting the prophecies of Daniel 7 together with Revelation 13 and 17, we see that all of God's enemies and our, 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 our enemies, and our enemies, I'm sorry, finally will be destroyed, and God's kingdom will remain forever. We also know exactly what the criteria are for that judgment. John chapter 3, verse 17 through 21, Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to, to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things have the, hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. This is Good News Bible. Okay. So, who does the judging? We judge ourselves by how we respond to the truth. We either run from it or we embrace it. That's, and in heaven, God just says, okay, which way are these people running? Are they running toward God or running away from God? That's basically all he has to talk about. Paul recognized that although the great controversy has ultimately been won by Jesus and the final results are beyond question, there is still something that needs to happen. Several places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament suggest that God will shake heaven and this earth. Who? Has God ever shaken this earth in the past? Yeah, well, yes. Um, when? During the flood. Well, great during the flood, a lot of things were shaken during the flood. Any other times? Uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, sure. Okay, and I think that's when, what he's... When Christ came out of the grave, 
Yeah, that's yeah, right. Sure. Another time. Yeah. So Haggai talks about this, Haggai 2 and Psalm 96 and Hebrews 12. The people's response to God's judgment is described clearly in Isaiah 33, 10 through 16. Uh, the Lord says to the nations, now I will act. I will show how powerful I am. You, mu you make worthless plans and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. How's that for friendly terms? Mm -hmm. You will crumble like rocks burnt to make lime, like thorns burnt to ashes. And I, I don't know if any of you, I lived in East Africa for many years, and those big old thorn bushes with big long thorns on them and so forth, when they dry out, you burn them and whoosh, I mean, there's almost nothing left. It's, it's just a little puff and they're gone. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. So how do people respond? The sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. It's not God's oh, not only God's judgment that's like a fire, His very presence is like a fire. We have already read, right? Can any of us survive a fire like that? You can survive if you say and do what is right. Don't use your power to cheat the poor. Don't accept bribes. What does this have to do with fire? Don't join with those who plan to commit murder or to do other evil things. Then you will be safe. You will be as secure as if you were in a strong fortress. You'll have food to eat and water to drink. So what's the difference between the people who are consume, consumed by the fire and those who are not consumed by the fire? The ones who are not consumed by the fire are doing God's will. Yeah. So the shaking of the earth is a metaphor in the Old Testament for the appearance of God. There's a theological fancy word for that. It's called a theophany the appearance of God. In Hebrews, Paul was trying to point out that the ways in which Jesus has become the overcomer superior to all others. Thus, the shaking of heaven and earth in Hebrews describes the destruction of God's enemies. This is promised already in Hebrews 1, 13. Well, we know that, maybe we should read that really quick. It's been a long time since we looked at that. God never said to any of his angels, sit here on my right until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. So, what's going to happen to the enemies? They're going to be placed as a footstool. They're going to be like the ashes that burn, the thorns that are burnt to make ash, right? Okay. While we know that Jesus has won the great controversy, God's enemies have not yet been destroyed. And there's a lot of passages here. I'm sorry, we don't have time to read all of them. 1 Corinthians 15. Actually, we can probably read that. Let me read that quickly. But each one will be raised in the right order. Christ first of all, then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him, then the end will come. Christ will overcome all spiritual rulers, authorities, and powers and will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. For Christ must rule until God defeats all his enemies and puts them under his feet. And when we say puts them under his feet, that means what? Basically, it means they're destroyed, right? God doesn't stand on people who are alive. God will finally destroy his enemies when he shakes the heavens and the earth. Is it hope, hopeful to us to know that someday all the causes of evil, sin, sickness, death, and disease will be destroyed? And when will that happen? Third coming. Third coming, when the earth will be purified with fire. The good news is that while there will be a terrible shaking and God's enemies will ultimately be destroyed, those whose names are written in the books of heaven will have a foundation which is unshakable. And here we have a number of verses that are talking about being unshakable. Jim, I think that's yours. Okay, Psalms 16, verse 8. I am always aware of the Lord's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. Good News Bible. Psalms 21, 7. The king trusts in the Lord Almighty. And because of the Lord's constant love, he will always be secure. Good News Bible. Psalm 62, 
Verse 2, He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender, and I shall never be defeated. Good news, Bible. Psalms 112, verse 6, A good person will never fail. He will always be remembered. Good news, Bible. Hebrews 12, verse 27, The words once more plainly show that the created things will be shaken and removed so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Also from the Good News Bible. So, while all traces of evil finally will be destroyed, we have promises in Isaiah 65, 17 and Revelation 21, 1 to 4 that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Carrie? I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. The Lord says, I am making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. That's from the Good News Bible. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. Let me interrupt for just a second. Have you ever wondered how God produced these visions that the prophet saw? Did he have a Hollywood outfit out there preparing? <laughs> I doubt it. Interesting, huh? Interesting, yes. He had some way of making making them see what he wanted them to see. I was on my run today. I was listening to El, were some words from Ellen White, and she said, "God showed me this. God showed me that." There wasn't history of the Old Testament. It says there's no question about it. I saw it with my own eyes. Okay, go ahead. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. That's from the Good News Bible. Soon then, Jesus will reign forever. His faithful people will join him. Reading again our key passage that we're really focusing on for this time. Hebrews 12, 28. Let us be thankful then, because we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him with reverence and awe. In Ephesians 4, 14 and Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, Paul said, Ephesians 4, 14, then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of the deceitful people who lead others into error by tricks they invent. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, there is much we have to say about this matter but it is hard to explain to you because you are so slow to understand. There has been enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any exper experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who, through practice, are able to distinguish between good and evil. Good news, Bible. Okay, here's a question for you. In order to learn to be able to distinguish between good and evil, do you have to be exposed to evil? Mm. No. You will be, but the fact remains everybody's <laughs> going to be exposed to evil. So whether we have to or not, it's it's a fact of life, is it not? Yeah. Well, so this is this is our challenge to to get skilled at distinguishing between good and evil. Well, that's what the Bible is. Yeah. It's a book of good and evil. Yeah. We got we pack it around. We can have whole walls covered of them. Yeah. <laughs> we can put it on our phone. How many versions you can put on your phone? Yeah, exactly. Good and evil. 
But it's, we know that the devil is very skillful at making his path just deviate slightly from God's path at the beginning. At the end, it's going to be way off somewhere. But at the beginning, it's going to look very close to, the, to God's path. We, that's why we have to be very careful, distinguish between someone good said, and evil. Someone said the most dangerous deception is closest to the truth. Yes, I, yeah. the illustration I used to, to talk about that is, suppose you took a piece of paper about that size, piece of paper, and you give a child a green crayon, you said, make a dollar bill for me. And, you know, he's trying to scribble on like this. If you took it to the store and you said, I want to buy something and here's my dollar <laughs> bill, they laugh at you. You, you know, they would, you know, <laughs> kind of, but if you go and find yourself a very, very skilled counterfeiter and he makes that dollar bill look exactly like the real one and you take it to the store, store it's likely that they will accept it. So the closer something is to the original, but not, not, not the original, the more dangerous it is. Mm. The closer it is to the original, the more dangerous it is, assuming that it's not the original, of course. As we become adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil, are we becoming? Or are we like the Israelites of long ago? And that's Isaiah 1, 11 to 17, very sad words. He, the Lord, says, do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? I mean, he gave them the instructions, didn't he? I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you came to worship me? When you come to worship me? Who asked you to do all this trampling about in my temple? I mean, imagine <clears throat> Isaiah probably standing at the gate of the temple and speaking these words to the people who come streaming in, thinking that they're just doing everything they have to do. Um, it's useless to bring your offerings. I am disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, or your religious gatherings. They are all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I am tired of bearing. I mean, wow, it's God is... It's interesting that he uh, starts his book this way, Isaiah 1, yeah. then toward the end, Isaiah 58. I hate, for, I hate your Sabbath observance. I hate everything you have bring to me. Uh, give me your heart. That's what I'm after. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen for your hands are covered with blood. Wow. Mm. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. Mm. Wow. Right there. Right. Wow. Okay. Micah I have, 6. I have a question there. Yeah. Uh, whatever time we have. How about the rights of the unborn? Huh? Yeah. Well, Not really. Mm -hmm. If when I read this earlier today, give orphans their rights and yeah. the, defend the widows, and I thought about how about the unborn? Yeah. Micah 6, 6 to 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? I mean, imagine if you had to make olive oil by hand. Thousands of endless streams of olive oil. Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just or right, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. In the Good News Bible. Wow. Wasn't that his first request way back yep. in Exodus? Yes. Yes, exactly. We need to be worshiping God in the right way by offering sacrifices of praise, confession, thanksgiving, and good works. Those are the things that please God. But God calls for more. We are actually supposed to be priests who are reaching out to those around us to teach them the truth about God. Jim? 
Exodus 19, verses 4 to 6. God told Moses to tell the Israelites, you saw, what I, the, you saw what I, the Lord, did to the Egyptians and how I carried you as an eagle carries her young on her wings and brought you here to me. Now, if you will obey me and keep my co covenant, you will be my own people. Whole, the whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. Wow. Okay. Another translation is to be a kingdom of priests. Yes. You want to read the, the New Testament? 2, yeah. 19, verses 9 and 10. But you are chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who calls you out of the darkness into his own marvelous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. Good news, Bible. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And made, us, excuse me, and made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To Jesus Christ be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Good news, Bible. Okay, now let me interrupt again for a second. What job will we have to do as priests when we get to heaven? Do they need more priests up there? It doesn't say you're going to be masters, does it? <laughs> no. You're going to have a message. You're going to have something to talk about, aren't you? And who are we, who are we going to be talking to? I'll we'll probably be giving some encouragement to some of the others that are there that have had maybe some different experiences, but perhaps the uh, onlooking universe. Yeah, almost certainly there are going to be lots going to be lots of beings out there in those other worlds that have questions. Come and tell us. What happened? Why did it happen? What's going on? You know, we, we, we want to hear it firsthand from the people who experienced it. Life uh, will never be uh, boring. No. Number one, number two, Sabbaths are going to be a delight. Yep. Uh, Emilio Canicli used to say, no angel has stood by the, the grave of his son, but we have. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and yep. So it's going to be beautiful, beautiful experience to share. Okay, you want to finish off there? Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on the earth. Good news Bible. Paul was aware of all these things, and he wrote Hebrews 13, 1 to 6. Keep on loving one another as Christian brothers and sisters. Remember to welcome strangers in your homes. There were some who did that and welcomed angels without knowing it. Let me interrupt for a second. Of course, you all know who that was, right? Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. I mean, imagine, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting to read those stories in light of what we know now in history from back. He, the, the, the meal that Abraham and Sarah prepared for God was not kosher. <laughs> He had milk and meat in the same meal. If you're a good kosher practicing Jew, you do not do that. <clears throat> Interesting. Okay, well, go ahead. Remember those who are in prison. I guess scroll a little bit more. I'm sorry. Who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who are suffering as though you were suffering as they are. Marriage is to be honored by all, and husbands and wives must be faithful to each other. God will judge those who are immoral and those who are commit adultery. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Let us behold then. Be bold. Can be bold then and say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Good news Bible. Okay, so are we willing to be, are we able and willing to be bold? To say, okay, I don't have to try to fight this battle by myself. I have God on my side. He'll take care of me. Can people do that in our day? Yes. Okay. 
Ellen White had some words to add there. Carrie? During the thousand years between the first and the second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. The Apostle Paul points to this judgment as an event that follows the second advent. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians 45, Daniel declares that when the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7.22, at this time the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. It's very interesting. Back in Corinth, there were people who stood down in the center part of Corinth every morning, and you could go down and pay them to witness in almost any kind of a trial. What do you want me to say? Okay, fine, I'll come and say whatever you want me to say in this trial. <laughs> What's Paul saying? No, this is not the way it works, and not in God's plan. <laughs> The saints are going to, you know, in, and, you know, in Corinth there, he, they were actually taking other church members to court. Well, I mean, with a kind of a situation like that, you know, you, you end up with the, the so-called so dirty linen of the church being in the public scene and so forth, and, and people lying and just saying whatever you want them to say. I mean, Paul says, Look, we're going to be judging the universe. We're going to be judging, you know, the angels. We're going to be judging the whole world. Why do you need to go ask those funny people downtown to come and be witnesses for you? Anyway, go ahead, Carrie. In union with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts and thoughts with the statute book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. Satan also and evil angels are judged by Christ and his people. Says Paul, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Verse 3, And Jude declares that the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day, from Jude 6. Mm -hmm. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 660 and 661. Yeah, those are the words just before she began, she, she sits on that uh, subject we suggested earlier, that you could start out with 662 and read in detail exactly the, the crowning of Jesus and exactly what happens at the third coming. You want to go ahead or, Dwayne, you could do that, 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. So you should not pass judgment on anyone before the right time comes. Final judgment must wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the dark secrets and expose the hidden purposes of people's minds, that is, their thoughts. And then all will receive from God the praise they deserve. So the records are there. God, in God's memory, however they're preserved, we don't know, but the records are there. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3, and Jude 6 to see a little bit about that. Do you not know that we shall judge the angels? How much more than the things of this life? Goodness Bible. And Jude, Jude 6, remember the angels who did not stay within the limits of their power, proper authority, but abandon their own dwelling place. They are bound with eternal chains in the darkness below where God is keeping them for the great day on which they will be condemned. Goodness Bible. Okay. So what kind of change does it take to bind the evil angels? Uh, 
circumstantial. They are, they are bound to this earth. They cannot go anywhere else. Where else in the Bible do we read about chains binding? Satan in the, uh, during the thousand years. Yeah, Revelation 20. Yes. Satan is seized and he's bound and he's chained, etc., etc. And we know, to yeah, there's no one to tempt. These are, these are circumstances. Satan and his angels will be bound to this earth because there's no place else that's to go. They could fly out there in space probably, but they're not. No one in any 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 place where anybody lives is is willing to accept them or listen to what they have to say. So they're confined to this earth, earth basically bound because of their what they have done for themselves. That happened when the Lord says it is finished. One of the most incredible things about God is how transparent his government is. How, how different would that be? Think about a transparent government. <laughs> there is no secret sessions behind closed doors in God's government. Everything is clearly open before everyone in the judgment. If you've got a hundred million observers, how secret is that? <laughs> After all that we have reviewed, Paul concluded in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 that we should be thankful because we have a permanent foundation that is unshakable. So what do we know about the final, that final judgment? What is the biblical basis for the pre-advent judgment? Here we need to look at the book of Daniel. For a deeper study of the pre-advent judgment, the apocalypse of John also should be studied. What's the apocalypse of John? Revelation. That's another, book, another name for, for the Revelation. The key passage for the pre-advent judgment is Daniel 7. We've already looked at some of that. This chapter displays a succession of kingdoms symbolized by a series of beasts, namely the lion, the bear, the leopard, and a terrifying, dreadful, and exceedingly strong animal. A comparison of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 makes it appear apparent that these two chapters are dealing with the same general subject, prophecies regarding the rise and fall of four major Mediterranean world powers. These world powers can be readily identified as Babylon, Media, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. After Daniel sees the terrifying, dreadful, and exceedingly strong beast with ten horns, a little horn emerges from among them. Suddenly, the vision shifts from the earth toward heaven, and a bright throne room comes into view. So these four, four kingdoms have passed, and all of a sudden, we're looking at heaven, Daniel 7, 9 to 14. The scene unfolds in three stages. One, a court scene, which we've just talked about where God is judging, and how many observers are there again? Hundreds of millions. Hundred million angels. Thrones are set in place. Two, the outcome of the judgment in which the beast is put to death. Daniel 7, 11 and 12. And three, the transfer of the kingdom to, uh, of the, the, the king for the kingdom to the Son of Man. And who is that again? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. The chronological events of this chapter display Babylon, Media, Persia, see Daniel 8.20, Greece, Rome, and the Little Horn, judgment and the possession of the kingdom by the saints. Daniel 7 repeats that there is a sequence. The fourth beast is followed by a little horn, judgment and the possession of the kingdom by the saints. Daniel 7, 19 to 27. Who's next? Mine? Yeah. Daniel 7, verses 19 to 27. Then I wanted to know more about the fourth beast, which was not like any of the other, be of the, like any of the others. The terrifying beast, which crushed its victims with its bronze claws and iron teeth, and then trampled on them. And I wanted to know about the ten horns on his head and the horns that had come up afterwards and had made three of the horns fall. It is, excuse me, it had eyes and a mouth and was boasting proudly. It was more terrifying than any of the others. So there's one little horn that comes up in the middle. And the, anyway, go ahead. While I was looking, that horn made war on God's people and conquered them. Then the one who had been living forever 
came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God, the time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. This is the explanation I was given. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all the other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will appear. He will be different from the earlier ones. and Very different. <laughs> very different from the earlier ones and will overthrow these kings. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Then the heavenly court will sit in judgment take away his power and destroy him completely. The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the Supreme God. Their royal power will never end and all rulers on the earth will serve and obey them. Good okay. Bible. Wow. A pre-advent ju judgment is not something surprising in the Bible. Think of the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in which God carefully came down and reviewed with them what the issues were before he pronounced judgment on them, right there in Genesis 3. The same is true in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God came down, consulted with his friend Abraham, sent his angels in effect to evaluate Sodom and Gomorrah before they were destroyed. So God didn't do that because he didn't know what the answer was already. He did that. Why did he do that? Well, you also got Job 1 and 2. Yeah, And then sure. uh, 1 Kings... Uh 19 is it or, yeah first thing 19 19 to 22 and it's another heavenly council yeah is there any reason to be afraid of the investigative judgment otherwise known as the pre-advent judgment once again note that the critic criteria for that judgment are clearly spelled out in john 3 17 to 21 and what does it say there how Jesus does it come to con condemn the world jesus didn't come to condemn the world and how do we, how do we get judged the words he has spoken. We judge ourselves. That's right. That's we either move toward God or we move away from God. God just has to look which direction you're going. That's just about as simple as that. Do God's criteria seem unreasonable or unfair? Would it be safe to admit to heaven anyone who does not live up to those criteria? Do we want to admit someone to heaven that's just going to restart the great controversy? No. Of course not. It would be hell for them. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. It's time for praying. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying together your word and following the guidance of the Holy Spirit that have spoken to the prophets and the apostles so many years ago. And those words are still preserved for us to study. May we come to integrate them into our lives so that we may become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.